Kitwe has a wonderful climate. Because it's over a thousand metres above sea level, it's never too hot nor too cold. The only unpleasant month is October, known locally as Suicide Month, and it is very hot and humid. In the rainy season, unbelievably heavy thunderstorms occur almost daily, often in the late afternoon, filling the huge storm drains within minutes. But, just as quickly, the rain stops and there is bright sunshine once again. This climate meant that it was possible to grow almost anything in your garden. Once the sun sets, you become aware of the chirping of the crickets and cicadias and the croaking of the tree frogs, sounds of Africa that you will never forget. After reporting at the mine, we were given temporary accommodation at what was called the transit flats. These were quite adequate, apart from the fact that they backed onto the railway line, bringing ore into the mine 24 hours a day. This made sleeping rather difficult. Our allocated flat was clean and comfortable and well stocked with basic foodstuffs. And we were also given vouchers to eat at the mine mess, known as Ernie's. One of the items on the menu, which caused us some shock, was monkey gland steak. We were relieved and embarrassed to find out later that it was simply a type of South African relish. Kitwe was very much a mining town and at that time employed around 12,000 expatriate workers. I was employed as an analytical chemist at the laboratory, which was staffed by a mix of European and local staff. The expatriate staff were mostly fellow Brits, and there was healthy competition in the workplace, together with a strong social bond outside of work. The general atmosphere was very friendly and cheerful, and we were to make some great friendships. The work was surprisingly demanding and challenging, working to the tight time schedules demanded by the various mining processes. There was a great emphasis placed on speed and accuracy, and my previous experience was most valuable. I was fortunate to steadily advance through all areas of the department with welcome promotions on a regular basis, leading eventually to the position of chief chemist. Kitwe was a pleasant place to shop, as all the streets were lined with flowering flamboyant and jacaranda trees. It was also a town that was spacious, clean, had plenty of parking, and there were also many small parks in the town. The hub of the town was Calunda Square, a pleasant, well-kept area devoted to shady trees and well-tended flower beds. The square was originally named in honour of Queen Elizabeth to mark her coronation in 1953. Obviously, the name became an early casualty of independence. At one end of the square was a small public library, and I think that I probably read every book during our stay. Here we are, strolling around, but did I really wear such short shorts? Mandy and Neil take time out while a couple of locals take it easy. A well-known building in town was the Hotel Edinburgh, which was right across the road from the rundown in Karna Hotel. Most of our local shopping was done at the state-owned OK Bazaars, but availability of certain items was always a problem. There were many smaller shops which were mainly Asian owned and tended to sell clothing or hardware. Some of the shops were shut on this early Sunday morning and Mandy and Neil took the opportunity to check their security. Maureen tries to look cool in her mini while the kids check out some of the sidewalk curios. As in most African towns there are always a large number of street traders offering fine beadwork, wire framed animals, carvings, pots and other African crafts imaginatively made from a variety of materials, all for sale on the side of the road.
An unusual sight we found on this Sunday morning was a London bus parked on some waste ground. I guess that it was being used for a Trans-Africa tour by some brave tourists. The kids had never seen a London bus before, so they were eager to explore. Kitwe Town Centre contains several imposing buildings, including the Rakana Club, Central Mine Office, Anglo-American Head Office, and in the Encarna Mine Hospital. It's Anglo-American's Pollock House that is the first place where new recruits are inducted. It was not uncommon to see newly arrived Britons lying sunbathing on the grass in front of the building with their shirts off, much to the amusement of the office girls looking out of their windows. They were laughingly referred to as VC tenors, a reference to those arrivals via the VC 10 jet from London. Another well-known landmark was the Encarna Mine Hospital, that I guess almost all expats have been grateful for at some time during their, st their stay on the Copper Belt. Although we didn't know it at the time, our third child was destined to be born there a few years later. We did not stay long in the flats as we were soon allocated a mine house at 27 Princess Street, close to the town centre. As a junior blue collar worker, we were only eligible for a modest G-type house by Copper Belt standards, but for us it was massive in size, although short on fixtures. At the time we had signed on for a one-year contract. Little did we realise that we would be in this house for three years. There was lots of space for the children to run around, but the garden was very untidy, so they couldn't really do any damage. We had been allowed to bring a fair amount of furnishings with us, and with the mine supplying a lounge suite, beds and appliances, this made, that made the house a lot more limited, like our home. There was even a very basic local TV channel, but with very limited programmes. The children were not phased by any of the lifestyle changes, and quickly settled into this new environment. Even Maureen had her kitchen essentials and even a calendar so that she could count down the days to our first leave home. But there was no lack of good facilities provided, including the excellent Rakana Club, cinema, swimming pool and a wide selection of sporting clubs. <laughs> 